And I'm going to, in the spirit of just trying to keep track of where we are, I'm going to call this Leadership 201. How do you actually build an affinity group? And does it really matter where people have a strong sense of belonging in the organization? Your organizations will be complex and will have many dimensions uh, to the matrix, whether it's a geographic dimension, whether it's a functional dimension, uh, you know, perhaps a global dimension, maybe individual functional teams. But does it matter when it comes to, to driving strategy execution, uh, you know, where, where everybody lines up? And where, in fact, they really identify most strongly. I think this point is most easily made if we just illustrate it again with some stories or a case study. Let me just share with you one story. Uh, Ed Breen, the CEO of Tyco, someone that I know well and have huge respect for, uh, within 10 days after he was appointed to succeed Dennis Kozlowski, I was in his office at 9 West 57th Street. Uh, Mr. Kozlowski has a beautiful office, by the way. <laughs> Quite a stunning view of Central Park, as you might imagine. And Ed Breen actually now is at one of these corporate parks on an exit down in New Jersey, just off the New Jersey Turnpike. Rents a little less down there, as you might expect. But anyway, I'm with Ed, and I'm the leader of a professional services firm. I sell professional services for a living. And so I know Ed well, and I sit down with him, and I say, Ed, uh, congratulations on you know, taking this appointment, stepping away from Motorola, and coming to Tyco as the CEO. Uh, what are the near-term challenges you have, and is there anything that we at Deloitte could be doing to help you? Uh, move forward on those key challenges. And here's what he said without hesitation. Jim, my first agenda is I want to make the Tyco employees proud to wear the Tyco t-shirts again. Think about that. Think about the Wall Street Journal for the 12 months before Ed stepped in as the CEO of Tyco. Think of all of those articles that you read about Tyco in our investigative reporting kind of tone. And now imagine you're a Tyco employee and imagine you have a Tyco t-shirt, where, where do you think that t-shirt is? And when you're headed to your kid's soccer match on Saturday, are you wearing that t-shirt? That thing is folded up and in the bottom of the drawer, baby. And you don't want a lot of conversation about that. Ed wanted to make those employees proud to put on that Tyco t-shirt again. He wanted to really create a strong sense of belonging. He viewed that as part of his job and part of what was needed. Now, a case study. Uh, I know that's a little bit hard to see, so I'll, I'll, let me just explain the chart. When I was the leader of Deloitte, and I'm refreshing my Deloitte strategy, and I've actually invested millions of dollars of my partner's money in researching this book as one, and I want to drive the Deloitte as one strategy forward, I decided to take our diagnostic and apply it to us. So I identified 500 partners that I, want, that I surveyed with our web-based tool. I took my 20 members of my global executive, all of their direct reports, that got me 250 very senior partners. And then wanting to understand what partners are thinking who have a lot of runway in front of them, I then took my CEO advisory uh, council for all four years. I had 20, a class of 25 four times, so I had 100 young partners there. I took 150 young partners off my future global leaders list on my succession plan. So I've got 250 very senior partners, 250 younger partners. And we surveyed them, and we wanted to get a sense of how important was Deloitte to their sense of belonging. And so the y-axis, for those of you who can't see it up the top, it says it's core to my identity. When I pull out that Deloitte business card, this is, this is fundamental to who I am. I mean, I, I, I almost, I can't think of myself without thinking about Deloitte. It is really, truly core to my identity. In my case, I'm at the top of that chart, obviously. And then at the bottom of the y-axis, it's, I don't identify with Deloitte at all. It's not important to me. I mean, I show up there, I get my checks from there, but it is not important to who I am. So the y-axis ranges from does not identify at all to core to my identity. And then the x-axis, we just look across the various dimensions of the Deloitte organization. The first column is me, Deloitte Tous Tomats Limited, the global organization. The second column is the member firm, so think Deloitte US, Deloitte Japan, Deloitte France, Deloitte UK, Deloitte Australia. You could repeat that 58 times. 
The next column is function, so think audit, tax, consulting, financial advisory. The next column is industry, so think manufacturing, consumer products, healthcare, public sector. And then the last column is individual account team. So what we asked these 500 partners that we were surveying, how do you identify with Deloitte and where is that identity strongest? And then we see that these partners actually identified with their member firm more strongly than with me, the global organization. Now, after I get my ego sort of adjusted for that, what is the next thought that I have when I, if I'm the guy responsible for driving strategy execution? Where are you going to go if what you want to do is influence the actions and behavior of 10,000 partners? Am I going to be the voice of the Deloitte as one strategy and everything that gets communicated comes from me, from the center? How much more would I get done if I had my country leaders, the voice on the Deloitte as one strategy, and I have my country leaders communicating that to the partners in their countries? Think about how much more action I can actually drive. But understanding where your people are and how they identify with the organization, I think, can make a difference. And what Meridad and I were trying to accomplish when we started the, the journey of the book and when we decided to go forward with the book, we believed we were doing something worthwhile. We're spending our, you know, my partner's money well. If we felt we could help leaders become more effective at their ability to execute strategy. So understanding this first dimension, we felt would be useful to a leader to understand as they're working to try to execute strategy. So, can, whoops, let me back up. Help me now, you're Ed Breen. How can you actually make people proud to wear those Tyco t-shirts again? What is it that you can do? What kind of actions would you take to try to create a sense of belonging, a sense of pride in the organization? Ideas, can somebody help me? We're trying to build that pride in Tyco. I'm trying to make my Deloitte people proud to carry that Deloitte business card. I want them proud to be able to speak to their peers when they go home, I work for Deloitte. It's important to me. What can we do to build that sense of belonging? Ideas? Help me. One or two ideas before I, I, I promise I'll move on if you help me. Please. Okay, the, the product or service. How do, the, how do the people in Cupertino feel when they actually see us go spend 600 bucks for that um, iPad? Quality product or service. Those people in Cupertino are very proud. Please. Okay, they, a successful organization. A successful organization is going to be an organization that has a sense of belonging. You want to feel that you're part of a winner. Winners have lots and lots of people who are proud to say that they're part of that. Success absolutely makes a difference and a quality product or service makes a difference. Please. Now say that again. Oh, oh have Ed wear a shirt. <laughs> have Ed wear the Tyco t-shirt, is that what you're saying? Okay, good. So Ed's proud to have that Tyco baseball cap and proud to have a Tyco t-shirt. When we go down to see the Phillies play, Ed wears his Tyco shirt. Please. Openness. Openness. If you want to have a sense of belonging, you've got to be open. You've got to be transparent. You've got to let people in. Thank you. Please, last one. Seek your input and be accountable. Okay, seek your input. Connect with your team and give them a chance to actually have voice in the organization. And as they feel they have voice, they're going to feel like they belong. Until you give them voice, it's going to be hard for them to really have that strong sense of belonging. I, I just think that when it comes to your challenge, organizational behavior, you're trying to get that team of diverse individuals you're leading to come together and work effectively to accomplish the common goals. Don't overlook and don't dismiss as not important this notion of creating a sense of belonging. There's nothing easy about it but you have to be overt about it. It is essential. Okay, end of Leadership 201. For those of you who are hoping that I move a little faster, you get to, we now get to move on to Leadership 202. And this is going to be, we're going to talk about how do you then get agreement on what it is that needs to be done? And how can we get commitment and real alignment to drive that forward? Look at that word, unleash. I love that word, unleash. How can you unleash the potential of your people and have them bring their very best? 
the leader that is able to unleash the potential of their people and get it deployed on those shared objectives is a very successful leader. I stole this from the CFO of Brambles. We'd, we've done an as one diagnostic uh, with them and he's a former, he moved from the CEO seat at a big company to he's taken the CFO seat at Brambles. And he thinks he can take the energy of his people and disaggregate it into two buckets. The first bucket is the contractual commitment. What does it mean to be an employee of Brambles? And what can you expect from an employee of Brambles? What contractually are you obligated to do as an employee of Brambles? And then the discretionary effort. And when you get that contractual commitment plus the discretionary effort, and now you have all of those calories deployed at your shared objectives, now you're going to win. Now you have the winning edge. Now you're going to be a team that is a high performing team. Now you can actually talk about things like excellence. You can talk about things like being the very best. You can really truly have an aspiration. You can go into the market with an expectation you're going to win. If you've unleashed the potential of your people and you have their very best. Now, what do you think this actually looks like um, in your organization? And then what, what portion of the team is supportive? They're not going to personally take action, but they're going to allow somebody else to do it. And then you've got some that might be undecided, you have some that might be unaware, and you might even have some that are opposed to taking action towards that goal that you've written down on the page. It's a hard thing to do, but just imagine for a moment you could pull that off. Now, let me just share with you uh, a survey. This is 3,000 knowledge workers, a survey done by Sinovate. And so they surveyed these knowledge workers and asked, and then they, based on the questions, they were able to disaggregate and decide what percentage were passionate about what they were doing, what percentage were engaged, what percentage were passive, what percentage were disengaged. And if I had a group of Deloitte partners here, what I would say is, guys, we're good businessmen. Our top line is 30 billion. We're a professional services firm. As a professional services firm, one half of our costs go in comp and benefits to our people. So we're paying $15 billion to our people. And then I say to them, where do you think we are, Deloitte? Do you think we look like this, Deloitte? If you think we look like this, Deloitte, where you've got 40% in the top half and 60% in the bottom half, I then say to them, guys, you're paying $9 billion to people who are passive are disengaged as it relates to executing our strategy. How do you feel about that, partners? And you can have some kind of reflective discussions. What I love to do when I have a room of 200 partners, I like to say, how many of you think the Deloitte statistics would actually be better than this? Our percentage above the line in the Deloitte workforce is greater than 40%. And I get you know, quite a few partners boldly put their hand up, absolutely, Deloitte is different than this. And then I have quite a few of them say, Jim, I, you may not like it. You may not like to hear this, Jim, but that's probably what we look like if we actually disaggregated our population. But my only point is, and when you think about that leadership challenge, contractual commitment plus discretionary effort, can you get that discretionary effort from all of your people? The only people on this chart who are going to be giving you your discretionary effort are those above the line. Think about how this enterprise performs if you could actually flip this so that you have 60% above the line and 40% below the line and how your team and how your team is going to perform if you could actually make that happen. Now, the Deloitte case study again. <clears throat> Think about the 500 partners I was describing and then you know, my partner Mike Stone King is over here. Ask any Deloitte partner about Quigley and they will tell you that he's a passionate client service guy. Almost all that he cares about is client service. Modestly exaggerated, I do care about my people. But I really have a passion for client service. If I hand select 500 partners, my top 250, my global executive plus their direct reports, 100, my young partner advisory council, 150 people off my succession planning list as future global leaders, when I hand select those 500 and I send them a survey with a directional intensity question in it, and so that very first column is the client service column, and the directional intensity question that they were asked was, are you personally committed to take action to deliver the Deloitte client promise as one, to deliver a borderless Deloitte in client service execution? Now, how do I feel as the global leader 
passionate about client service. I communicate tirelessly about client service. I have every right to assume these 500 partners that I self-selected, 95% of them would be absolutely committed to take action to execute the Deloitte client promise as one every time. Deliver a borderless Deloitte in client service execution. And then what do I learn? I have 42% of them committed to take action personally to deliver the Deloitte client promise as one. I have 20% uh, of them supportive of somebody else taking that action, but they're not going to do anything themselves. They're supportive of somebody doing it, but not them. Shockingly to me, I have 25% who say they're undecided on whether they would take action there. No less shockingly to me, 8% of them saying I'm undecided. Fortunately, none of them said they were opposed to this idea that Deloitte is a client service organization. Now, I don't put that up to try to make fun of Deloitte. I love that firm. It is core to my identity. Let me tell you, baby, I'm 38 years at Deloitte, and I'm very proud of this firm. I'll go to market, and I'll compete with anyone with Deloitte. But the point, if in fact a leader's job is to drive strategy execution, when you get the privilege to look inside the minds of your people and they respond to an anonymous survey of their commitment to, in my case, I tested 10 elements of my strategy, how better able am I now to really drive strategy execution when you know where your partners are and what they're thinking? And, you know, can I convert some of these undecided? Can I get some of these supportive, ready to take action? Can I finish my communication to those who are get labeled as unaware? Can I become more effective at my ability to drive strategy execution? I think the answer to that is yes. Now, <clears throat> another thing you can do looking at a chart like that is try to say to yourself, wow, how are you going to um, actually win if that's what your partners are thinking? I was with a group of CEOs and someone put forward, maybe some of you have heard this, I've never heard it before, but it was fascinating to me. He called it the rule of the revolution. And when I was with the uh, cabinet minister in the province of Ontario, she said to me, Jim, if I waited for consensus across my 28 ministries in the province of Ontario before I moved, she said, we'd never get anything done. My four years in, uh, she's a former CEO, now the cabinet secretary, she said, my four years in public life would be over before we even moved the needle. If I've got 40% committed to go, we go. And we start moving, and everybody just simply starts coming. And what uh, this former CEO, uh, he just stepped down as the CEO of Selene, 6,500 people. He's the one that talked to me about this rule of the revolution. Here was his rule of the revolution. The number of people you need committed to act if you're trying to transform an organization is equal to the square root of the number of people in the organization. So to Dave Weedman of Selene's, what he's saying is he's got 6,500 people to move Selenies in a transformative way, he only needs 80. He needs the right 80. He, ha he can't pick those 80 randomly. But if he has 80 people, he can move Deloitte. Now, Quigley has 10,000 partners. How many do I need to really transform Deloitte and how we're behaving? Is it really the square root of 10,000? Do I need just, you know, 95 people? Do I need 100 people? If I had 100 partners and I had the right 100 partners, can I transform Deloitte? The point is, don't wait for consensus. When Coach K was talking to us about what he did as he formed that Olympic team or what he does as he forms that team in Istanbul and what he plans to do as he takes a team to uh, the UK, he identifies the four leaders. <coughs> The square root of a team of 12 is three point something. Coach K thinks if he has four passionate and committed, and if he selects the right four, he can pull that team together and really pull it off. So in your complex organization that you're leading, if you think we can't move until we have consensus, we can't take action until I have everybody agreeing, I think you're wrong. Pick the people you need and then go after them. Get that Kevin Durant look, that pace, that multiplier effect of the leader. 
and you can really make some things, make some things happen. I based the research team that pulled AS1 together in Australia. So Deloitte Australia is the only place where we've used my AS1 diagnostic three times. And then I tell you my CEO in Deloitte Australia, six foot four inch South African rugby player, one tough guy. He knows how to drive accountability. The first time we, uh, <coughs> the first time we did the AS1 diagnostic, look at the length of the green bars. Partners committed to act. You start talking about strategy execution. You build a vocabulary. You're driving execution. You're moving forward. Look how long those bars become. Third year, look at those bars. Now we're testing 10 elements of the strategy, three elements the first time. How do you think Deloitte Australia is performing <coughs> in a, in a well-intentioned way? Please, please interpret this. Don't, don't don't translate this into arrogance. This is a well-intentioned comment I'm making. I heard someone from one of those other professional services firms trying to do a little marketing for that firm a little bit earlier. If you want to actually work for the market leader, you can come to Deloitte. <coughs> <laughs> but now the point. How would you like to compete in Australia with Deloitte? Look at that from the partners, that commitment to act. When we put Guillaume, think again of my six foot four inch South African rugby player as the CEO of Deloitte Australia. When we put him in, we were 55% of number two in Australia. Today, we're number two in Australia. There's a line at our door in Australia of partners from other professional services firms who want to be part of that firm. When you get a strong sense of strong sense of shared identity, when you've got strong alignment and commitment, our language, directional intensity, you're going to be, somebody earlier said, messages about winning, momentum. Read the articles in Australia about professional services firms, and you'll be reading about Deloitte. Look at their performance. We're taking share from our competitors in a breakneck way. Getting your team aligned and committed to act on executing strategy is the essence of leadership. Guillaume gets organizational behavior from Deloitte Australia. They're making a huge difference, huge potential. End of Leadership 202. Now, for those of you who are really looking forward to me finishing, I'm going to give you the good news. We're now going to move on to Leadership 301. And I think this is the hardest part of leadership, and this is where we spent all of our time in the book. All of the book is devoted to this notion of how we work together. And we focus that when you're trying to narrow your manuscript down and you're trying to think how long can this book be. We just decided there's lots written about conditions for success, laying the foundation, there's the attributes of a leader. All that is well articulated. There's many things written about how can you actually really create a sense of pride and sense of belonging in an organization. And there's a lot written about alignment and commitment. There's almost nothing written about how can we become more effective at working together. That's why we made what we believe was our contribution to the management literature here. Can we make a substantive contribution to, and I'm going to call it again, Leadership 301. This is the hardest part of leadership. Can you get agreement on how people want to work together?